little bit about yourself. What's the backstory uh, of Daniel the person? <laughs> yeah, sure. So, um, Discuss is actually my first company, but uh, it's also my first uh, real job. Uh, to be honest, I, I did uh, technical internships when I was in college. Um, and I uh, had a number of um, you know childhood jobs, but as far as something out of school, Discuss is the first thing I did. Um, and same story with my co-founder. So we started to discuss um, uh, while we were still in school, and it took only a few months before we realized that this was something that we were really um, interested in pursuing. Um, not specifically for any reason, but really just because we love uh, we really love the idea of building things and um, uh, moving straight into it without all of the all of the barriers that uh, we got accustomed to when. Um, you know, working with uh, larger companies. Okay, so so uh, before before I go into, so I have a few discuss questions, but before that, sort of where did you grow up? How did you? Where did you go to school? How did this uh, whole thing happen? So what is the uh, yeah? What is the what is the backstory? Uh, like you know, almost where do you draw your inspiration from? Would be I guess the 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 idea. Yeah, yeah. So I grew up. Um, I grew up here. I'm in San Francisco right now, uh, but I grew up here in the Bay Area. Um, a little bit south of San Francisco, about uh, about 40 miles south of here, in a town called Milpitas, and it's right in Silicon Valley, right next to San Jose. Um, my my dad, my father, uh, worked with tech companies, um, you know, the entire time I was alive, from the sort of finance and business side. Um, but it really gave me the opportunity to learn about some of the companies out there, um, a lot of hardware companies, a lot of you know traditional software companies, but. I'm just spending time with those and just being uh, being really inspired by um, how much is out there uh, just w around where I am. And it's sort of like you know growing up in Hollywood and seeing the movie studios and um, uh, music studios all around you and and uh, sort of being right in the middle of it. Um, and it was it was I never knew any other life. So um, just understanding that you know people uh, um, some people don't have this opportunity. So. Um, I was very excited about that. I was always very much into um, computers and technology, um, you know, mainly for that reason. Just because I thought it was very cool that it was it was it was it was all around me, and um, I was uh, surrounded by it. So I started um, I started working with computers very early on, um, you know, between the ages of seven and nine years old. Mm -hmm. Started programming. Um, uh, not too long after that, not a very good programmer, but um, Started uh, before middle school, um, and um, I started on the web uh, a little bit after that. Um, and uh, when I was thirteen, maybe twelve years old, I met um, um, uh, another little boy named Jason, who actually ended up being my co-founder. Discuss, and we met in a advanced algebra class in uh, middle school. So, one of the first things we ever did together. Um, actually was to play StarCraft, but the second thing we ever did together was build a website, and um, that website was a way for us to share uh, music. It wasn't a web application, it was simply a website, and we um, uh, we were able to scrounge enough um, you know, free web hosts together to be able to upload small files and uh, spread that, and this was probably, um, you know, probably around 97 or so. so this was a little bit right before you know peer to peer became something that people really use. So yeah. um, Napster wasn't really a thing yet, um, or anything that our friends use. And um, over time, we just spent a lot of time um, uh, creating these small uh, file sharing websites. And uh, one of the early things that you know we kind of point back to when it comes to discuss is we had a lot of online communities, uh, okay. forums, uh, discussion boards, IRC channels, Usenet groups, yeah. um, and uh, it was something that uh, was. Fun for us, and uh, we, we did that together. Um, I that was something that we were just uh, we were two of um, some of the nerdy nerdier kids in school, so we kind of worked together on those things. Um, throughout high school, we weren't as close, and we lost touch a little bit. But um, we kind of reconnected again when we were in school, and we both ended up going to the same college, um, a place called UC Davis, which is sort of um, outside the Bay Area in the um, north part of uh, California. Yeah, and. Um, we uh, we both we both ended up uh, studying computer science and engineering, and 
sort of reconnected and, and started uh, doing projects together again. So it was, it was almost like uh, we picked up um, uh, picked up stuff again since we were you know 13, 14 years old, and now we were you know 18, 19 years old, and we were starting to work together again. Um, so over the next couple of years, we uh, we did things a lot of you know small micro projects, but um, uh, you know I, I think one of the big driving factors was that we were both fairly bored um, in school. A lot of the engineering and computer science classes were uh, were um, were already done for us. We just we just completed those, and we had a lot of like um, unrelated things to tackle before we could finish finish up school. So that was that was a very attractive reason for us to leave. Um, I was I was very poor in chemistry. Okay, I remember this. So I, I was I think I was put into like a remedial class for chemistry. So I was never I never was able to take the the class in order to graduate school. So I kind of put it off for a few years. And um, one, uh, <laughs> and um, it, it sort of came up for me to take. I had to take this one class before I graduate. I, you know, already finished my computer science and engineering courses. So we ended up just leaving. We we thought um, there was nothing else to learn. Um, we thought there were a lot of opportunities out there to do cool stuff. So uh, we started to discuss while we were still in school. And probably about two and a half months later, we left and uh, started doing full time. And this was how many? This was two years ago. No, this was we're in our we're in our fourth year at Discuss. So uh, we launched, yeah. So we launched Discuss um, sort of at the end of two thousand seven, and uh, really started to make it a company in two thousand eight. And and the inspiration was: Did you have your own blogs, or or was it just to yeah. to to improve commenting on the web? So the inspiration around Discuss was actually more around online communities as a whole. Mm -hmm. uh, it had nothing to do with commenting or even blogs. Even today, I wouldn't even consider myself um, any sort of expert on how blogs work. Um, I'm certainly not a blogger. Um, I won't pretend to be. I don't really know a lot about blogging. Um, actually, I take that back. I actually know a lot about blogging now, but uh, I was never one myself. And um, Discuss started out as a way for uh, us to take what we know about good online communities from all the times we spent on message boards and IRC channels and all these sort of um, micro niche communities that mm -hmm. exist all over the web to talk about um, to talk about technology or to talk about um, you know trading uh, movies or trading music um, all these like small communities where you end up creating a lot of, uh, making a lot of friends outside of the initial topic that mm -hmm. you're um, that you connected for mm -hmm. so we want to discuss to be a new way for a new way for discussion platforms to work and really taking into account the best of breed um, rules, concepts, and guidelines on uh, what made communities successful and start to bake that into the software itself. And that would make it so Discuss became something that not only um, was better software, but understood the ways that bad and good communities um, uh, formed and existed and really try to help people um, create the best ones. So uh, one of the initial ideas was to make this um, completely completely networked and the reason for that was when I was on you know you know some forum that talked about computers and I was a complete badass there and everyone knew who I was and I had you know great sort of virtual reputation um, I, I didn't want to lose any of that value when I traveled to you know something that talked about um, video games you know they're not exactly the same communities but a lot of the uh, cues about my contributions still existed yeah. and I want to carry that over so uh, we, we start off on this on this product, um, this this project, we call it Discuss. And one of the first things we did was um, kind of look at the way that um, it worked. And we created a feature where people can embed a micro form into a website itself. And at that time, I was trying to start another blog. And I've created many, many blogs in my life, but I've never really kept up with them as far as blog posts. Yeah. So this was sort of an excuse for me to say, hey, if I... Um, if this connected with my blogging endeavors, maybe I'll continue to blog more. So yeah. we kind of embedded the website. And um, we kind of showed it around, and that was actually the idea that, that people really resonated with. And we kind of thought about why. And a lot of forums are create a lot of engagement. Yeah. But they're very hard to build a business on or really monetize. Yeah. So a lot of media publishers or bloggers, um, the way they make money is off the content they produce. And yeah. uh, what Discuss was able to do over a period of you know the first couple of months is really take the dynamics of a web forum discussion forum and uh, create that within 
uh, the area of content where they're actually making money, where they're spending the time with the design, where they're making sure that they're offering the best experience possible. So this was uh, that was the first feature we did, just embedded to a website, and that was the thing that took off. Um, so over time, we just simplify the product, simplify the functionality, so it resembled more like comments rather than anything else. So um, uh, what started out as a discussion platform became a comment system, and yeah. now we're actually on a path to go back toward discussion platform as we build it out um, um, and sort of fulfill what we're really after. Okay, so what's the vision? What's, what, what, what is it 10 years from now? What, what, is, the, what is the big objective? Yeah. Um, I don't know what it looks like 10 years from now, but the way that I look at the web is today there's a lot of huge emphasis on uh, social, and it's because we have access to all this very personal information about people which makes transactions and exchanges very authentic and um, trustworthy. So now I can, you know, I can buy something off you online, I would feel good about it because I have a good sense of who you are, and I think that sort of dimension that is opened up on the web has created a lot of excitement and a lot of has drummed a lot of interest in making everything more social and more um, transparent. I think that's a really cool thing. Um, but it, it really does make you think about uh, where that takes the web and how that's different from the origins and the true um, uh, the true philosophies of the web to begin with. And when I started um, you know when I got familiar with the internet, not even the web, but with the internet and then the web, it was, it was all about an exchange of ideas and voices, and there were online personalities, but it was mostly about uh, people who were able to share ideas uh, regardless of who they are. Yeah. So I sort of think see discuss as um, um, the mark that we, will make, that we want to make on the web is really pushing this idea forward of um, communities, personalized communities where discussion still very, very much matter, right? It's not about um, the sort of it's not about taking your offline world and moving online and making small chatter and, and commentary. It's really about building real, um, real communities based on the contributions of um, loyal audiences. And, and I think that's really where um, that's really where publishers and independent bloggers are struggling to define themselves today. They have really great content, but content can be commoditized so easily because you can read that and consume it anywhere the users are, and that's great for them. But for them to offer a very unique experience, they have to do something that is completely personalized and completely unique. And you know, some ways that people do that today is they have like media, like media outlets like Fox News, while wow, they're Bill O'Reilly's or their um, Glenn Beck's, right? Strong personalities that represent a brand. That's a unique sort of brand that no one else really replicates. And the same thing with MSNBC, Rachel Maddow, um, other characters that people have. And these news outlets or these publishers all have their own tone. And perspective on things, and I think the community that comes out of that represent it, represents it in a big way. So, uh, what we want to do is help these um, niche communities—not niche, but like very narrow and specific communities all over the web—carve um, out their own personality, carve out their own uh, communities with their own rules. And that's very different than um, having content discussed across social networks, because that's where the people are, and they're doing those things. But when you are creating a community, you're creating a nightclub or a bar, you're creating a lounge where people can come in and they're familiar with people around them, not because they may know them from another life, but because they, uh, they like being at the same bar. They like, um, they like the, the, uh, the sort of exchanges they have with those people. And we've seen that exemplified really well in smaller communities around specific interests like video games and fantasy sports and stock trading. Um, really great characters there. but. Also, with um, you know bigger brands that have a strong personality, like Al Jazeera or Fox News or even CNN, they have a personality to it, um, which really resonates throughout their community. So, the bigger vision with this guys is we certainly don't want to be, um, we certainly don't want to take and just own the concept of commenting. It's, yeah. it's been using commenting as the familiar, accessible um, action on the web yeah. um, to feel what we believe is a canonical discussion experience as we expand that across the web, but really into all parts of um, interactions. If you know, there's discussions that happen everywhere, whether you're on a um, desktop, whether you're on a phone, whether you're watching TV, and there's a discussion happening about it, there's these, every, there's these small uh, opportunities to discover new types of communities um, that are uh, just super strong.
Okay, cool, got it. So, so you, you're, you, I mean, now moving, shifting focus back to Daniel, I guess. You're the Silicon Valley boy, uh, you know, pretty much got gr- grown, grown up all through. So, what is, the, what, what inspires and drives you? Uh, what, what, what gives you energy when you wake up in the morning? Um, what inspires me? Uh, a lot of things inspire me personally, and that's people around me. And I think I'm, I'm constantly inspired by the things that people do. But on a broader note, I'm really, really fascinated about, on a very, actually on a very macro scale, I'm very excited about the whole notion of technology being commoditized. And that's sort of a weird phrase, but let me explain that a little bit. Um, right now in Silicon Valley and in San Francisco, everything is considered a technology company. So whether or not you are, maybe you're creating a new way for transportation or you're creating a new way for um, digital publishers to you know, have conversations or you have new ways of payments, they're all technology companies. And if you think about it, that's sort of interesting because it's sort of like, you know, um, 100 years ago, uh, or yeah, 100 years ago, um, companies were elec- electric companies. Like if you use electricity, you were unique and um, that, was, uh, that was your classification. But right now, everyone's used technology. It doesn't really make you a technology company, right? You're still, it still can be verticalized in so many different ways. So I'm really excited about how this whole thing is headed and, um, and just understanding that uh, as a whole, we're not just building um, web or technology companies anymore, but it's just gonna be a commoditized thing and then people will build completely new industries on exactly what we're doing. Um, so I'm, I'm really interested in just uh, how that spreads to um, the next two generations, the next immediate two generations of people using the internet. Um, that's what drives me, and I think that with what I'm doing today with Discuss, we still have a really big opportunity to make a significant impact on shaping that vision of what the future internet will be, the future web, and that's sort of the baseline for technology. You don't, you know, we really don't want more we consider internet companies or technology companies. You want the internet to be so pervasive that it's taken for granted and all sorts of things are being created on top of it. And that, that means that right now it's still sort of a wild west and the infrastructure is still being built, the rules are still being built. Yeah. And because we're in it at this stage, I think it's such a very exciting thing for us to be able to start shaping some of those rules before the next generation of you know, industries are built on top of the you know, so-called technologies. Yeah, no, that, that's a fascinating thought. Okay, so um, I guess, you know, uh, all the way from growing up to, you know, becoming a co-founder, it, it can be pretty lonely at times. So who, so who are mentors uh, that, that, that you've, I mean, you know, both people you know, people you don't know, but people, but role models who've, who've inspired you? Yeah, um, this is, yeah, this is a little cheesy, but, you know, honestly, my, um, my long-term role model has always been my, uh, my dad. And uh, he got me to computers. He got me to pretty much anything that I was interested in. Um, even today, I love uh, I love things like cars. And um, he got me to cars. He got me to computers. So there's a lot of things about his work ethic and his view on you know how uh, you know his views on technology that really inspires me. And I still talk to him very often around um, um, these things. And he's always been a very curious person. Always making sure that. Um, I had access to, um, I had some sort of access to uh, gadgets and electronics and um, um, new software when I was, you know, very young, and and that was a, you know, I, I never wanted to take that for granted. I think that's been an incredible uh, opportunity for me to um, experience things that a lot of people um, weren't able to. Mm-hmm. And other inspirations are, um, um, I'm very fortunate to be in this area where I'm. Excuse me. I'm constantly surrounded by other um, entrepreneurs um, of all backgrounds, of all ages, of all um, of all types of different drives. Maybe they do things for different reasons. They care about different things, but uh, I'm surrounded by people who really, really care about what they're doing. And um, you know, you can't help but always feel a little bit lazy uh, in comparison to them. So you're always pushed to uh, work a little bit harder and to um, achieve a little bit more. And that's really cool. I've gotten to know a lot of good guys through uh, through doing discuss and doing and and working with investors. Um, we did something called Y Combinator um, yes. when we started that, yeah. and uh, a lot of great guys um, were connected to us through that. And I'm still a lot, great friends with 
lot of them, um, still my neighbors, still my, you know, my office neighbors too, they're around. So it's, it's, it's a really great ecosystem for them. Well, I'm sort of thinking, and it's not, it's not really because of the, you know, the assembly line or, or even the automobile, but I think it's around, um, I think it's exactly around that. It's around his, his views on industries yeah. and um, uh, what that means for people. What that means for companies outside of auto, like the auto industry, and his impact has always been pretty, pretty uh, far-reaching. Oh, no, that's great. So, so was there a defining moment in all this, this whole journey, or was it just a natural evolution of you know heading into what you did? Defining moment. Um, we have we have we had a bunch of them, uh, a bunch of like major milestones along the way. Uh, I would say. You know, I, I can, nothing will ever top the, you know, the first couple of weeks of getting started. Um, and uh, a lot of it was the transition from kind of playing house to to actually having to run a house. And we, you know, I remember we, uh, me and my co-founder, we would meet up at a, um, at a diner. Uh, it, was, it was during break when we were still in school and we would sort of come with, you know, um, Fake business plans and fake, uh, you know, product um, product requirement documents for us to kind of work through. And it was just, it was just very it's very formal. It was it was sort of make believe and, and fun to pretend. But uh, we kind of use that and and uh, try to learn as much as we can about the industry. So I've, I always found that sort of as a cute, charming moment. Um, and that was you know that was before we actually got started. But a lot of these things where we're just we're trying to mimic what we see and and you know read about online. Um, and uh, it's funny with all the resources about how people do things. You end up, you end up having to throw most of that away and just kind of doing things your own way and just yeah. seeing what works. Oh, that's great. Last couple of questions, Daniel. And I think this one is one I particularly enjoy because I, I get maximum value out of this. So you know, you yeah. know, in your week, uh, what are little things, routines, stuff, hacks? that you use to stay productive, uh, stay focused? What are, what are some little things, uh, you know, little superstitions, I might even call it, uh, that, that you stick to? <laughs> In order to stay productive? Yeah. Um, it's a really good question because it's, it's 11.45 p.m. right now and I'm <laughs> still wrapping something up at the office. I'm not sure I was super productive today. There's a lot of stuff going on. I can tell you things that, <laughs> things that I need to improve. Uh, it's sort of interesting because the... Actually, I have, I have, I have, I have this thing that I always do. Um, I'm a big, I'm a big person. I'm a big uh, list maker, and um, I always identify um, the week's goals because um, everyone that you know, most people will have a to do list, and they kind of add up over time, and it's a mixture of big things and small things, medium things, and they end up filling up a lot of times. A mixture of reactive things to email, things that you should do yourself, and maybe things that will come up when you have lots of, you know, meetings with yeah. people where you're not really doing anything, but, you're, you know, you think you're being productive. Um, so uh, every week is, uh, is, a, is a small bullet list of things that, that need to be accomplished to make the next week different from this week. So um, this week we'll have a list of three or four things, and... If I don't accomplish those things, if we're not doing those things within the company, then next week will be a bad week. And I could have 20, 30 things on the to-do list throughout the week, and they'll always be adding more things. But if I don't get these three things done, um, it becomes an issue. So always identifying the very, very sort of top level is really important. I also like creating lists. So every time I run into an issue, um, I always start out either, either with a notebook, Evernote, or a Google Doc, and I write... Um, sort of a goal sentence at the very top and usually something simple like you know fix X or we need to address you know or um, uh, communication is poor over here and always keeping that at the very top just a very simple sentence and then um, using bullets to kind of detail the path from yeah. today or this very moment um, all the way down to how that will be fixed because I found a lot with people a lot of the issues people have is uh, things will come up, challenges, but the steps to address them always get very fuzzy. So, um, you know, you'll talk about issues, you'll complain, you'll have a big email thread with, you know, three, four people, 14 people, 40 people, and it's just all these opinions, and 
the, the real steps are never defined. So I always kind of keep things in a very execution driven way. So um, you're never really doing anything unless the document, the little note that you made has that mission stand on the top and all the bullets are um, all the steps needed in order to um, completely execute on it. And I find that really helpful as well. Um, so I have just hundreds and hundreds of those laying around, around uh, just literally write the, write the problem at the very top and then keep working down step by step. Perfect. Final question, I think, uh, is, um, so you know, it, it, it's, it's always, um, I guess it's always expected, but what is a message to all, all the people watching this, reading this? And I, think, and I think a big part of the audience are people, you know, who are looking to build things, lead groups, maybe their own companies, maybe their families, you know, uh, but what, what, is, what is a message you would have? Message to people who are looking to build something and do something? Mm -hmm. um, I have a couple of messages, I guess. One of my favorite things to keep in mind is um, you're never too good for any opportunity and that was a really helpful thing in the earlier days that allowed um, allowed me to really uh, get my foot in the door um, with various things and just always understand. You read a lot of advice about how to um, make smarter decisions and how to optimize some of the things that you want to do and um, people put a lot of um, emphasis around how valuable your time is how, how, how valuable an entrepreneur's time is so you want to be able to make smart decisions and um, outsource as much as you can. And I think that a lot of that is true, but um, an important thing for me to keep in mind is to never let that, to never let that cloud your judgment on taking opportunities. And anything that comes up that you think could lead to something new, um, to take that. And, um, you know, I think that, that has to be combined with good judgment, but in general, um, you know, someone told me once is that when you're when you're starting something new, and um, even if it's a completely new concept, you're always competing with something, either the status quo, um, maybe something that's a little more nascent, or even a um, established incumbent. And whatever you're competing against, um, they could have more money, they could be smarter, they could be better looking, find your people, they can be better than you in every way. But the one thing that you always can't control is that you can um, you can want more. Right, you can be more prolific, and you can try harder. Um, and that kind of stimmies back to take as many opportunities as you can. Um, the uh, the other the other lesson that I picked up along the way is um, it's it's very easy to drag your feet because of all the lessons and advice that you get from people. And there's always so much advice floating out there. Um, it's it's sort of a wonderful thing this ecosystem and and, and this industry because everyone has done some version of what you're trying to do um, in the technology side, in the entrepreneurial side, in the um, you know, deal making side, everyone has some sort of tip and advice. Um, so it's very easy to second guess everything you do, but one of the things I've learned is to whatever decision you do make, um, really push hard on it and, and make it fast. And uh, fail fast, right, and, and, and try to learn from that. And these are these advices that, you know, I hear as well, but you never really, you never really know until you do it yourself. Yeah. Oh, fair enough. Hey, that's, that's awesome. That, that's, that's all I had in mind in terms of the interview.